I'd like to call this meeting of the Northwest Local <coughs> School District Board of Education to order. Chris, if you would please call the roll. Mr. Detzel? Here. Mrs. Detzel? Here. Mr. Harlow? Here. Mr. Heather? Here. Mr. Unger? Here. I would ask that you all join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Our next item is approval of minutes from the December 8th meeting. Yes, we have. The first one is from December 8th. The treasurer and superintendent recommend the board of education approve the minutes as listed. So moved. Second. The motion's been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, Chris, please call the vote. <coughs> the motion to approve the December 8th meeting minutes passes 5 to 0. And the December 15th minutes? Yes, the treasurer and superintendent recommend the Board of Education approve the minutes as listed. So moved. Second. The motion's been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, Chris, please call a vote. The motion carries 5 to 0. Our next item is the recognition of an all-state Northwest High School student athlete. Good evening. We are very pleased this evening to recognize a second all-state student athlete, one from Northwest High School this evening. And to do that, we have Athletic Director Joe Pollitt here and Head Coach Nate Mahan here to introduce our student athlete and congratulate him. So Joe, if you'd like to come forward. Good evening. Um, thank you to the board and district leadership for letting us uh, present tonight and we're doing our recognition this evening. We appreciate it. Um, we're here tonight for Cortez McGinnis. He's a graduating senior this year. He was named second team defensive back all Ohio by the Associated Press in uh, Ohio Division II. You know, it's tough because there's not a lot of defensive stats that are tracked. Um, you get sacks, interceptions, fumbles, but you don't get tackles. Um, so it's kind of hard to, to quantify, you know, some of the defensive players and their contributions at times. But uh, as Coach Mahan will tell you, Cortez was very much an integral part of our senior class who can claim for the first time in Northwest history that they had a winning record all four of their years at Northwest High School. So my hope is that, you know, years from now we can, can sustain our momentum and Cortez and his teammates can look back and say, you know what, we were part of that transition. So um, go ahead and introduce Coach Nate Mahan and we'll introduce Cortez. I appreciate you guys letting, letting me talk tonight. Um, now I get to do this two years in a row, so I hope it doesn't go stale. But uh, on the drive here and talking to Cortez, um, I just let him know that you know this is the second year in a row we get to do this, which is pretty awesome. Uh, and and I am very proud as a coach and uh, to be in charge of him and, and to be up here and, and present him this award again and talk about being all state because it just it just doesn't happen much. So I hope it's a sign of things to come uh, and and to continue. I don't want to talk about Cortez's stats a whole lot. I want to talk about Cortez as I've known him over the last two years as a, as a young man and getting older. Just a couple of things here real quick. Um, Cortez, I hope he doesn't mind me telling everybody this, but he lost his father two years ago right when I kind of came in. And uh, I got to know him and his brother very quickly. Um, we hung out a little bit more. And uh, as you get to know everybody on the team, um, I knew right away that Cortez was a football player. And he was a mean, a mean dude out there and uh, a guy you want on your team. But the more that the weeks went by, I got to know him as a young man, and uh, he opened up a lot. He went from a guy that didn't say a whole lot and uh, was a leader by example to, to this year he really talked a lot, and he spoke like, communicated. He, was, he knew what was going on in the defensive backfield. He knew what was going on, really, everybody on the defense, and that's why our defense was so good this year. Our offense wasn't as, gr as great, uh, but our defense was very, very good, and we were able to stop people. But that started with him. That started with him at strong safety. He got everyone lined up. He made the call. He knew what was going on. So to see him mature over, over two years' time was very impressive. I, I told him, uh, and I really believe his better days are ahead of him. He doesn't know where he's going to school just yet. We're working on that. He's got a lot of people interested. He's going to make a college and a team very, very happy uh, in years to come. So he's very deserving of the second team All-State, and I'm proud to be his head coach. Cortez, I think this goes to you, right?
Congratulations on overcoming great adversity. And congratulations. Moving on to our next item is a special presentation, Dr. Jackson. Yes, I'm going to introduce Mr. John Fox. He's going to come up and give the board the presentation that we have regarding the recent survey that we completed both through the telephone and online. So I'll go ahead and turn it over to <coughs> Mr. Mr. Fox. The only issue is, am I going to be able to work this thing? <laughs> Click on the but I have to be holding something down, right? No. <laughs> right. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Yeah, let me back up. All right. Uh, I'm going to try to do this in about 15 minutes. Uh, my name is John Fox. I'm a research-based marketing consultant. Uh, here in Cincinnati. Uh, this is the 12th school district for which I've done a study like this uh, over the past several years. And there is a very long version of this uh, in PowerPoint uh, that is a lot longer than what we're going to show you tonight uh, with a lot more details. But uh, just starting with the objectives of the research um, was to secure feedback from Northwest School District residents on school facilities issues and particularly to gauge intent to vote in favor or against two different options for facilities. And for simplicity's sake, and there were very long concept statements that were uh, read and written for the research, but uh, there was a concept, renovations, consolidation, construction of elementary schools, renovations of the mil middle schools, and renovations of two high schools. This is what we're calling the two high school plan. Then the same plan as above, except with only one high school, the Northwest High Building would become a freshman school. That was the major difference between the two plans. And just so you know, to avoid any kind of bias, every other interview, they were presented in different order, so people got to assess them one at a time and then compare the two. Uh, also, very important, to determine awareness of and opinions on issues related to the plans, their need, their relationship to current teaching and learning trends, their financial implications, and a focus on having two high schools as one. And then to analyze the feedback, both overall and by demographics where appropriate. And the actionability of this research, as is in every district where I do one of these, uh, number one, to provide a go, no go decision for placing this bond issue to fund this on the ballot uh, in May and which option to pursue. And then just as important, if it is placed on the ballot, determine the best sales message, positives to emphasize, negatives to address, and sources for information for pre-vote marketing, PR, and other communications to help ensure its passage. I am a marketing researcher, not just a pollster. This is true marketing research that is intended to provide the district with whatever it takes here to get this passed, assuming that it receives enough support in the research. A key goal is to let the district community know that based on their opinions, the recommended facilities plan is what they want based on the research feedback, not just what the school board or administration wants. Methodology, um, between December 1st and 16th, we conducted 333 completed telephone interviews and 167 completed online interviews. Actually, the district was extremely responsive to this. We had more than 800 surveys from which to randomly choose 167 to go with the 333 phone to get us to our goal of 500 completed interviews, a very highly quantitative sample size in the research business. All participants were screened for being a resident of the district, a registered voter, and planning to vote in the May 15 election. And then again, as I mentioned, the two plans and their voting related and reason why questions were presented in a different rotation every interview to avoid order bias. And where there were multi-part questions on various things, those were also presented in a different random order every interview, again, to avoid any order bias. 
I'm going to track you through uh, all of the important questions in the research a as they were asked. Um, one of the early questions was, which one or two of the following issues do you think should be the top priorities for the Northwest schools to work on during the next few years? This is a question that we typically ask in any district where I do this. And one of the choices was improving the educational facilities for our students. Well, they were given um, some of these choices as well. And 54% is the way to read these. These are always percentages. Said improving students' performance in the district's academic standing. 29% said improving the educational facilities. But interestingly, and we will start to see a theme here, um, stronger among males, 44% if they have kids currently in the schools, and 47% if age 50 or younger. So we tend to see this type of trend um, throughout all of these questions where if somebody is younger, if somebody has kids in the schools, then of course they're going to be more tuned into um, the facility's needs. What happened here? Okay. Um, where do I point this? It's not a matter of pointing. You just pick on the left side of that circle. Well, that's what I'm doing. Oh, okay. All right. That's where we were, right? Yeah. Okay. And we then asked general opinion. In general, do you think the Northwest local school district buildings and classrooms are good, adequate, or poor? <coughs> 42% um, said adequate, 23% said poor, and again, much higher among younger people, let's say, and don't have enough information as expected, much higher for that among older people. And again, this is really giving uh, Pauletta you, <laughs> a lot of this is for you in terms of developing targets for your PR plan, et cetera. Um, same type of question compared to other nearby school districts, would you say the appearance and physical conditions of the buildings are... 35% said not as good, but it was 59% if they were age 50 or younger, and 57% if they have kids currently in the schools, not as good as other districts. And then offering the latest compared to other school districts in terms of latest in education, teaching, and learning, 24% said not as good, again, stronger if they were younger and had kids in the schools. Where do you get information? And again, this is kind of interesting also because you're going to need to reach people in the general community. Um, my children are students, 31%, uh, 31% 31 also from the Northwest Press, but if they're older, that's a much stronger vehicle for reaching people. Um, something to know, friends, relatives, word of mouth, and then it drops off significantly uh, from there. Okay, then the key questions in the survey. We read a very detailed concept statement describing these plans, again, in a different rotation each time. Um, so then we ask, if the vote for this bond issue for renovating two high schools, three middle schools, and two elementary schools, plus three new eleme elementary schools and eliminating two elementary schools were held tomorrow, would you say you would be? And we always give them this five-point scale. Strongly in favor, somewhat in favor, have no opinion, somewhat against or strongly against. I will tell you, in all of the research that I've done in other school districts, these top two combined tend to be very predictive of what the vote's going to be, sometimes within as close as one or two percentage points of the vote. So when you get numbers in the high 50s or even the 60s, that's very encouraging. So 64% combined said they were in favor of the two high schools plan. And if you want to compare that, the one high school plan, 38% said they were strongly or somewhat in favor, and 47% were against it. So, you know, clearly much more positive results. Again, evaluating these one at a time in a different rotated order each time. Again, 64% versus only 20% against for the two plan, two high school plan, and 38 compared to 47 against for the one high school plan. We also had a question comparing the two. Which of the two facilities plans do you prefer the most? And clearly decisive in favor of the two high school plan, which is renovating two high schools, three middle schools and two elementary schools, plus three new elementary schools and eliminating two elementary schools, as opposed to the one high school plan, which said one renovated freshman school, where Northwest High would become a freshman school. So clearly decisive. And interestingly, this 51 to 22 win, if you will, we looked at it across all demographic groups, and the two high school plan is a statistically significant winner over one high school in every demographic category except if they never had kids in the school. And even there, it was still statistically equal, if you will. 
And here's some demographics on just focusing on the two high school plan, again showing you, and again, this is all as expected in what we've seen in other school districts as well. They're going to be more strongly in favor, 64% total were in favor of the two high school plan. They were age 40 or less, 78%. If they currently have kids in the schools, 71%. They never had kids in private or parochial school, 70%. But even if they did ever have kids in private or parochial school, 60%. Or, you know, all of these numbers are above 50. So pretty good support for this. But you can see it does correlate with age, a little bit with gender, uh, with awareness of the situation, which is a question we asked early on in the study, and, of course, having kids in the school or not. Now, what I'm going to show you here, we asked an unaided, open-ended question after we asked them, how strongly are you in favor? Very simply, why do you say you would be strongly in favor, somewhat in, in favor, strongly against, or somewhat against? To get in their own words why they were for or against this. What I'm going to show you are the positives for the two school plan, two high school plan, and then the negatives for the one high school plan. Again, the full report has all of has a lot more slides than this. I also forwarded to the district an Excel file that literally includes all of the verbatim responses, so you can see the passion that people had more or less in favor of the two high school plans and conceivably against the one high school plan. All of those verbatims are in a separate file. But again, the way to read these, the stripe bars are sort of the net roll-up of whatever's underneath them. So anything cost or efficiency related, 31% mentioned something that is a reason why they were in favor of the two plan. Updates, renovating is more practical than building new, let's say, saves money, cost efficient, etc. Needs related, 21%. Prefer keeping two high schools, 15%. Tax-related issues, it would not raise taxes. That was really a key. This was presented as a $90 million plan, which in concert with the uh, upcoming um, tax levy renewal um, would not raise taxes. This is actually the first district where we've been able to present a plan like that that didn't raise taxes. And so um, people were in favor of it because of that reason. And then some lower mentioned reasons, education reasons. We always see this good for the children, more productive students. Positives on consolidation, etc. Those are the positive reasons volunteered for why they were in favor of the two high schools plan. The negatives on the one high school plan far and away were related to the fact that it was leaving the district of one high school. They don't want a freshman only school, prefer to keep two separate high schools. Issues on the one school that's left being too far away, et cetera, prefer two high schools. 50% of the people said something one high school related as to why they were against that. Another 30% mentioned something negative about consolidation in general. Too many kids at consolidated schools, too crowded, prefer the same number of schools, no consolidation. 14% mentioned something education related, and again, we've got a separate file of verbatims on these, uh, and then some of the lesser mentioned ones as well. So these were in their own words. Now, in addition to offering them plans at no tax increase, we did try and test, well, what if there was a little bit of a tax increase? And interestingly, we took this up, we did these three questions, an additional $35 per 100000 appraised home value, $70 and 105 and as expected, the support is stronger for this. Now, I do realize that since the time of this research, the board has come up with a plan not only to keep no tax increase, but to actually lower taxes, correct? Because the plan went from $90 billion in the last four weeks down to $85 million. Um, so it's kind of encouraging that there would be support for even raising taxes. 59%, 57% strongly in favor or somewhat in favor versus 32%. That's a statistically significant win for that, not so much for this one. But if they're going to be in favor of an increase and, and, or no increase, that certainly speaks well for the plan you're going to come out with, which actually lowers people's taxes. Now, you'll see in some of the later questions that they still don't quite understand how that works, and that's really going to be a key PR goal is to explain to people how that works. Um, we then tested some hypotheses. So after hearing from them in their own words, we throw some agree-disagree scale questions at them and try to see which ones have the strongest agreement or not. And this really does support the two high schools plan. Better school facilities will improve a student's academic performance. 72% agree versus only 22% not agreeing. 
Um, regardless of various construction op options, something needs to be done right now. Strong agreement. Um, excellence com of the schools contributes to higher property values. These are all potential selling points. The Board of Education will be responsible and wisely spending money. Much more agreement than disagreement. And then interestingly, on the second slide, um, let's look down here for a second. The one that had the least amount of agreement was it will benefit the Northwest School District. They have one high school compared to the current two high schools. This was the first time that we actually aided them and prompted them on the fact that, hey, this plan has one high school, this plan has two high schools. And clearly, 56% disagree that it will benefit the district to have one high school, and 26% agree. Um, conversely, and this is interesting, it's an improvement to have all the elementary schools be grades K through 5, which was another selling point of this, compared to the current situation where some grades are K two, some are, have grades three to five, and only two are K through five. Fifty-five percent agree on the positives of that compared to only 26 percent disagree. So that's an interesting comparison. You know, they're in favor of the consolidation point for the grade schools, primary schools, but not necessarily for eliminating one high school. Um, and then some other questions. Um, I would only vote in favor of the bond issue if it has no tax increase associated with it. Fifty-five percent agree. 35% disagree, and again, you've now come up with a plan that actually lowers their taxes, so even better. Current schools meet the needs of students? No, they don't. 37% agree, 39% disagree, so you don't have strong agreement for that. Now getting to more of the, uh, the PR issues, we then look at um, specific selling points uh, and find out how relatively important these are. And there were two that were clearly more important than the rest, although they're all reasonably important. But the two that were deemed the most important were that the, there's a facilities plan is necessary for Northwest to keep up with the latest in teaching, learning, and particularly in the areas of science, technology, engineering, math, the STEM areas, if you will. And also strong importance for the newer renovated schools are needed for the long-term future of the district to ensure the next generation has adequate facilities. Those are more important than some of the other issues, um, something like if there are schools, the performance will improve. Again, still more important than less important, but not as important as these top two reasons as well. Schools are inadequate, they're fairly strong, but again, not as strong as, as that one. And then finally, awareness of specific issues. So we laid these five issues and asked them to self-evaluate themselves. Are you highly aware, somewhat aware, or totally unaware of this? And interestingly, the one with the least awareness is that it's possible to pay for $90 million of school construction with no property tax increase by replacing operating lovely renewal funds with bond issue funds. So that's your biggest PR challenge here, is to convince the people that yes, this can be done. And in fact, now you're even going to have a decrease in your property tax rate, not an increase at all, you know, as opposed to plenty of knowledge and awareness of how old the schools are. 10 of the 13 were built prior to 1970. Um, the STEM education trend requires improved learning space, you know, fairly good awareness of that, and then it drops off to these three, but particularly this one is your biggest opportunity. Convincing them that yes, we can do this without raising your taxes or now even lowering them. So just as an executive summary of, of what we've seen, major conclusions from the research, the research confirms the Northwest School District community support for a facilities plan that includes keeping both high schools, but not for the option for one high school with the other building becoming a freshman school. The key questions on intention to vote on a possible bond issue for the two different plans show 64% in favor of the two high school plan, 28% strongly, compared to 38% in favor of the one high school plan, 13% strongly. A follow-up question comparing the two options, as I showed you before, shows 51% preferring the two high school plan, 22% preferring the one high school plan and 9% not liking either one. While the proposed plans involve no tax increase, responses to later questions show willingness to pay some tax increase. And then further support for the facilities plan can be found in the volunteered reasons for voting intent and the specific hypotheses tested indicating a recognized need for improvements, acknowledgement of the cost savings associated with updating and consolidating schools, agreement on the positives of having all elementary schools be K through five, and disagreement that it will benefit the district to have one high school. Strongest selling points for the plan are needing improved facilities for the long-term future and for the STEM 
education trends. The biggest opportunity for communications, as I just mentioned, is to help pass a vote appears to be the lack of understanding or believability that this $90 million plan can be implemented without any increase in the personal tax rate, with some still seeing it as costly in general. A lot of people focused on, oh, $90 million is too much. Well, it's not costing you anything. So that's pretty good, particularly compared to some other districts that I've done these for. There are also some negatives expressed about school consolidation in general that need to be overcome by the positive news of this move. There's some awareness gaps regarding the ability to do this at no cost to taxpayers and regarding the specific study that determined that 12 to 13 district schools have serious needs for renovation and replacement. And as always seen in these types of studies, support for the two high school plan and awareness and understanding of the issues is stronger among younger individuals who currently have children in the schools, less so among empty nesters. Always a challenge in any district. I mean, typically 60% of every school district on average is empty nesters, and those are people certainly less likely to vote in favor of something school related. And I'll show you some numbers on the next slide. Interestingly, support or lack thereof for the one high school plan is relatively flat across all demographic segments. So indicated actions. These findings in conjunction with other school district research that I've done, as I said, 12 different districts, point to proceeding with placing the two high schools plan on the ballot. During the time that the research was being conducted, as I mentioned, the Northwest School District has indicated a desire to move ahead with an even lower cost plan. 85 million, eliminating the renovation of one school and resulting actually in a tax rate reduction now. This plan could prove to be even more appealing to voters than what was tested in the research, assuming that they understand how the tax reduction works, given the bond issue in combination with the renewal of an operating levy. Experience from other districts proved that in order to pass a bond issue, it always takes a full-time district-wide PR effort to communicate, particularly to older households not involved with the schools, the need for this project, its long-term benefits, the tax implications, and the potential consequences to the school and taxpayers should the bond issue fail, plus making sure you get the right people out to vote. And here are the numbers I was talking about. If 60% of the district consists of empty nesters, you need to get 45% of those in favor and 60% of parents of students to get your 51% in favor of the bond issue. And again, what I've seen in previous districts is when those top two numbers in terms of strongly and somewhat in favor are up in the high 50s and you have a good PR plan, it usually passes. Now, those were 64% in this case. And I don't think you have to waste any time convincing people that there should be one high school because that's not the plan you would be going with. So that's, that's going to be much harder, much more of a challenge for you to try to sell them a one high school plan. But the two high school plan you know, should work. And again, this research and a lot of the details in there, Pauletta, give you what you need in terms of putting together a great public relations and communications plan for this. That concludes this presentation. I will open it up to any questions. Well, thank you for such a comprehensive report. I'm a little <clears throat> surprised, not surprised, to see the feedback on our narrow grade range versus going back to K to 5. Have we had any comments since that came up three or four years ago? Or No, we haven't had any recent comments. Nobody's on come that. forward and said, boy, I hate this or I like this. And So no. it's interesting to see in your survey that there's a trend to want to go and back to Maybe they weren't aware of the alternative that K through five K to exist. five. So, yeah. Yeah. And, and what we're trying to do here, and to, to go back to your point about it, it being a lower tax rate, the bond issue combined with operating money would be less than the current millage that I believe was passed in 2010 which was due to renew in 15 anyway. And, and what the goal of this board as we went through our discussions was, if we could just knock it down a little bit, that would be helpful. So, so if, if the 2010 levy that was that's scheduled to renew in 15 is for a little bit less, that's yeah. what we're talking about. It will be for a little bit less millage. And if it passes, it'll actually be a little bit less on your next property tax bill after that. But for some reason, that may prove to some people to be too good to be true. So you need to convince them somehow of how and why that works numerically, right, it'll, economically, it'll, whatever. The fact is it'll be less. Yeah. Um, I'll see if there's any other comments from board members first. There's well, go ahead. There's a in the audience that right. wants to comment, so I don't know how you're going to work him in. But okay, well, let me let sure Pam go, and then we'll, I guess we can, if the board's okay with that, we can mm -hmm. allow Mr. Fox to take questions from the audience. Sure. Okay, Pam, I'll let you go first. I, I think this is going to be valuable information when we prepare um, for the levy campaign. 
I think something else that we need to make sure um, to remind our community, the only way this is even possible is from the foresight of the previous board, from the, the cuts our employees took. Our employees were on three-year pay freezes. Had they not done that, we wouldn't be in this position to be able to even do this where it wouldn't raise taxes. Also, I mean, we made really, really difficult cuts. We had lots of kids in more than one study hall. Um, $16 million in cuts was a lot, and it hurt all the way around. Um, the only thing good about it at this point is now we're here that we have the opportunity of doing something really, really well. So I think we need to make sure that our community remembers what our staff did. Our staff took cuts for three years and for all the other cuts that, that happened. And now that's put this in this position that fiscally we can even entertain anything like this. So it's, it's an exciting opportunity that is going to benefit every student in this district. And I'm fine with taking questions from the audience related to the survey that you've just um, presented. And please stand up because there's a, a mic back there. I'd like the TV feed to pick it up. So we welcome your question if you please stand up, sir. My name is Mark Bennett. Um, Mr. Fox, you went through it pretty fast. It's a pretty good presentation. Um, I do have a question or two. <clears throat> I may have missed this because you did go through a short presentation. I understand there's a longer one you can yeah. give to the board. But you presented to all these surveyors the options of two things. The possibility of one school, high school, or two high school things. Did at any time was it mentioned that if this levy doesn't pass in 2015, their taxes drop drastically because there is no then renewal? Yeah, no, no, that, that was not mentioned. Okay, yeah. Were there any other questions from the audience? Or any other questions from the board? Yeah, and I just, just want to add, and sir, your point is well taken, but um, the thing with that I find incredible, and, and I agree with Pam, people sacrificed not only at the school district level, but out in the community. I know the hospital I worked at, people actually took pay cuts, not just pay freezes, they took pay cuts and had their hours reduced. Um, but the, um, the thing is, I do not ever remember in my life, and I've been around here longer than I can, it's hard, it's hard to believe, but I graduated from Corain in 1974. Um, I don't ever remember any governing board, township, state, school district ever lowering taxes. I don't know if there's somebody in here who remembers that, then I'd be curious to hear about it. Um, yes, they could vote it down and they'd save even more, but I think that because we have been good stewards and this is a tremendously positive investment that we're all five excited about. Um, I do remember that we did have some polling results for a levy, Pam, back in like 2004, mm -hmm. and it said it would pass 60% to 40 and it lost by 12. It wasn't your company, John, but, uh, um, uh, you know, the numbers you had, 500, that's what they do for presidential polls, you know, yeah. say five, Nationally, it's projectable, so obviously, yeah. you know, so, but, uh, like this, sure. so, you know, we went through trying times, all of us, with the, the downturn 2008 up until, well, maybe even still recently, but I, I think this is a win-win, and, and to have us all excited about it is something that uh, is, is quite unusual in its own way. Yeah. I think it's a win-win, and I thank you for your uh, presentation here. I think all, all of us on the border and all of us in, uh, that want to uh, see this levy succeed are going to have our work cut out for us. It's going to require a lot of door-to-door -door retail, member-to-member, uh, person-to-person uh, campaign effort. Uh, and obviously, it's going to be uh, separate from you know, current district resources. We're going to have to uh, put together our, our own team, but that's obviously something Well, and again, the good news is, that, you know, in addition to a volunteer effort from the community, you know, you do have a person here that's going to commit themselves to this, correct? <laughs> and that's good, because some districts, I mean, I'll give you a, a great example. Did a similar study like this in Milford uh, three years ago. They did not have a full-time PR person, and they lost 
very narrowly in November, hired a full-time PR person, and then passed it like by almost 60-40 in May the following year. So it, we don't we don't have a full-time PR person. Just okay. to clarify, but we have someone that does that maybe five percent of their time, but that's about it. So we have our work cut out for us as well. We will be relying on many many volunteers as part of a levy team to make this happen. We're just very beneficial that the person that has everything else on her plate too is very good at what she does and puts a lot of extra time. It's not a typical work week, anybody that knows Pauletta and what she does. Yeah. It's, she goes above and beyond on everything. So we're very fortunate for that. And you've got some really good direction here. Absolutely. From this on what's important to people, what isn't important, and you know, it would be a lot more difficult if you were trying to sell them on one high school. So. Well, I found it yeah. interesting. The one thing, and, and I've worked on all the levies, is to see that obviously we need to connect with our older voters and you already gave us the piece of I think it was age 60 on gets their information from the Northwest Press right. so I mean that's yeah. that's great because we know now where to target Absolutely. that information directly to the Northwest Press yeah. so and I would um, the the more full survey that was completed which is not what was just shown I when we post the minutes of this will that be posted with the minutes so Anybody would be able to go back and read that? Uh, no, it will not be posted with minutes now. It's part of our agenda, though. Right? It's already, the current presentation is posted as part of the agenda. Okay. All right, was there any other comments from the Board or Administration at all? Well, thank you very much okay, for yes, coming. And, 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 uh, if, if anybody, and, uh, please feel and, free and to hang on. your version if you have any questions. My phone number and email address are on the last slide. So. Okay, thank you very all much, right, John. Any thank, you. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. And we'll move on to our next item, which is a legislative update. Mr. Harlow. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Mr. President. The uh, House and Senate were uh, sworn in today uh, to begin the 131st General Assembly. Uh, at this time, the committee assignments have not been announced, so there have not been committee meetings yet either. So I really, uh, for all intents and purposes, don't have a report. Thank you, Mr. Harlow. And our Baller Tech update, Mr. Denzel. Uh, Dan, we haven't actually had a meeting since our last one here at Northwest. Our uh, meeting's coming up in next Tuesday. So the following week we'll have an update. Okay, thank you, Jim. Our next item is a special report, Dr. Jackson. Yes, I'd like to introduce Mrs. Claudia Farmer, who's going to come up and give a report. Um, she's principal at Struble Elementary School. And I brought Karen Grayson, our instructional coach and assistant to the principal, to share um, with you as well. Um, we want to give you a little peek into what struble has been doing this year to um, improve our student achievement and close that gap with our, um, our students. Research shows that if students don't benchmark for reading fluency by the end of second grade, that they will not be good readers. Think about that. Eight years of age, and you need to benchmark at those, those things. So we have our work cut out cut out for us. So in following, um, it's red. Oh, great. Okay. All right. So um, the district has a, a district goal, and we are working on goal number one. By the end of school year 2015-2016, students in the Northwest School District will meet or exceed the state goals in all measured categories, and the categories are listed there. And um, the ones that Struble is closely working with are the achievement, the gap closing, and progress, and the K-3 through literacy. Our, the district strategy um, it, under curriculum instruction is to align and implement and monitor scientifically research-based curriculum instruction and assessment with the state's challenging academic content standards and the Marzano common language of um, learning. So over the past several years, um, we have worked pretty diligently to, um, to understand and implement Marzano's common language of instruction, especially the impl um, implement elements regarding learning goals and scales. 
Marzano's research shows that 20, students can show up to a 21 percentile point gain um, in their learning just by doing the learning goals in scale. So that was really important for us. And the action step for the district was as a building or required teacher-based teams um, that utilize the common protocols and recommend changes in instruction that are monitored by the evaluators in grades K through 12. And as a building, we've been um, using the TBTs for a while to analyze the, the data and guide our instruction and assessment for several years. This year, the teachers are meeting more frequently than required um, to make the necessary changes as they look at that data and um, need to make some changes. And we've implemented some programs, so they're constantly looking at it, like they're, they're taking their lunch and, and meeting as a group and having a, a planned lunch time and looking at that as well. So that brings us to our building task plan. Um, we have three different items that are listed here for you tonight. Um, what Claudia just mentioned about our grade level, our teacher teams, they meet regularly, not only at the scheduled times when we have planned for early release, but also, um, like Claudia mentioned just today, I happened to be in the lunchroom when second grade teachers were eating, and they were very diligently working on some plans um, for some fly time, which we'll talk to you about in just a little bit. Um, also that our grade level teams, our teachers and title tutors will examine data specific to our subgroups. So we're looking very closely at our students with disabilities, our economically disadvantaged students, um, our students who um, also are our top learners because we found that really those are the students that sometimes we really struggle to reach. We have a lot of interventions and good things in place for our struggling learners but tend to um, sometimes not ignore their needs, but they kind of get um, set aside a little bit. So we wanted to come up with a good plan to support all of our students. And then also we felt it was very important that our teacher teams use the five-step process um, to determine if the instructional practices that we are using at our building are indeed effective in helping our students. Um, this, oh, this screen doesn't look so good. No, don't This isn't going to be good for you. No. Uh, but we can kind of talk through it a little bit. <laughs> uh, it didn't look like this earlier today when we looked at it. Um, the MPG, that stands for Map for Primary Grades. That's an assessment that we're using at Struval, and it's directly tied with student growth, which is tied to our teacher evaluations. Um, for our intensive <coughs> purposes, there are four different uh, color groups that we use with percentiles to, um, to know where our students are. So the blue group are our highest learners. They're greater than the 80th percentile. Our green group um, are those students who we would consider typical learners, the 40, 41st to 80th percentile. Our students in the yellow group, you can see 21 to 40th percentile. And then the students who are in the red group, which is our most struggling learners, they're below 21%. Um, just to kind of give you a glimpse of what our numbers were like, we were hoping to be able to share that. Um, we actually test three times at, at Struble. We have a fall um, benchmark, our, our baseline score for students. Um, in the next few weeks, we'll be actually doing our winter test, which is an optional test, but we like to use that at our building, much like some of the other elementaries do, um, to kind of see where our students are falling uh, mid-year. And then we have our spring test. Um, and what we found with our percentages, there really wasn't much change when we looked at it. Um, but what building we, wide. Building wide. Um, we did find, though, and it was interesting, at the end of the year when the teachers were able to look at their student growth, there are so many reports that are generated um, in this, this site. It's really great. Our teachers have really learned a lot about the reports and have been delving pretty deeply into them this year to use that data to make instructional decisions. Um, but the teachers came to both Claudia and I at the end of the school year and said, really, what more can we do? We're, we're at the point now where... Um, I had a teacher say, I feel like I've done more for my top learners this past year, Karen, than I've ever done. And still, those are my students that are not showing the growth. We had a lot of our students with disabilities who showed more than a year's gro growth. Um, overall, I'd say the majority of our students were able to meet their growth target, which was really, um, it was a great, a great thing for us to see as a building. But we really felt that there was more that we could do to help all of our learners. When we looked at it, and it's hard to see that it's jumbled, I mean, on <laughs> Um, it's not jumbled right here, but it's very small. I'm going to try to make that. The numbers don't show, but when we looked at from the fall to the winter, our, our kids made a lot of growth, but nationally, there we're not closing that gap. So we had to start thinking, what else can we do? What else can we do? 
So, but I did want to share that um, at the end when we, we get our teacher performance or teacher um, student growth measure for each teacher um, this fall, 16 of the 16 classroom teachers, eight of them um, fell in the highest category of most effective, four fell in above average, and four fell in average. So we, they at least made the mm -hmm. year's growth for in, in on the, however they calculate that for their classroom. So these were some things as we closed the year last year. Um, Claudia and I had a lot of time to talk about what we could, what we could do, and what we could encourage our teachers to do to kind of help um, close that gap. We also talked to our building leadership team and um, kind of came up with four changes that we really wanted to make at our building level to see how we would do um, as far as advancing our students. Um, so one thing we talked about was modified classroom grouping, and the modified classroom grouping we took. We used to take our kids and just divide them up. So each classroom had a, a little bit of our high learners and a little bit of our middle kids and a little bit of our low kids. But we thought if we take that, that top group off and put them together where we had six, eight, ten kids, the teacher might be able to do some um, really good instruction with those kids um, in a nice size group where instead of having two and you're just trying to, trying to make do and you've got six or seven levels of kids. Um, so we have... Um, two classrooms at first grade and second grade that support those high, highest learners and then um, it's still a pretty heterogeneously divided group but we, we pulled off those top kids and they have um, we'll see if, after the winter testing if that if that part's working we also um, kind of modified our title groups which as Karen said we're going to talk about fly time which is number four on the list but because of the the, the fly time group groups that we added um, during the day we were able to kind of modify our title groups and serve um, a specific number of kids that need certain things in that group instead of trying to and trying to <coughs> reach a whole lot of kids and not do, not probably not do as good of a job with those groups and then our change in our ELL support we've decided that um, we're gonna some of our, our we have a big influx of children who have come to us this year that speak no English at all and so we pulled we're gonna pull those to get those kids together in one title group to do some vocabulary um, which they so desperately need to just even get along in the school environment. <clears throat> and then the last one, Karen's going to talk about fly time. So that brings us to fly time. And you know, we are such an acronym rich, um, you know, business. <laughs> so when we were talking with our BLT, our building leadership team, we were trying to come up with some kind of cute, catchy phrase that the kids would really like and jump on board. So it's been, uh, sticking with our Blue Jay thing, we came up with fly time which stands for Forever Learning Youngsters. Am I correct? Yes. Kids know it is fly time now. And they really look forward to it. Um, after much planning and pre preparation, I have to tell you that it looks really easy on paper, but this is hours and hours of a lot of just um, thinking through, thinking logistics, um, managing schedules. There's a lot to consider um, when you're trying to come up with a plan such as this. But after putting all of our heads together and with a lot of good input, I think we've come up with a really um, good plan and I'm really anxious to see in the next week or so when we get those into results if this um, has actually worked in our building. But um, what it looks like is this. With kindergarten, they're a little bit different, obviously because they have a shorter day. Um, but they do meet three days a week. And what they're doing at kindergarten is doing a one-to-one -one student teacher ratio. So we have, um, five, we actually have six title tutors, but due to our skills lab needs, five of our tutors and then one educational assistant all kind of flood and go to kindergarten together. Um, and so for five minutes, a teacher or a tutor will pull out um, a student and work really intensely on this on those needs that have been identified um, by the teachers and tutors together. And then in first and second grade, it looks a little bit different. Obviously, we have them for the whole day. Um, again, for three days a week, for 30 minutes at a time, um, the teachers sat down together, looked at the reports, and then grouped the students according to skill need and um, and where they felt they fell um, into the different instructional skill that they were working on. So those groups can range from anywhere from eight students with some of our lowest learners to as high as 17 students per teacher. Um, we have seven grade level teachers that meet with the students. We have five title tutors and then one educational assistant. So we're able to get 13 groups of students meeting um, at different ability levels working on the same skills. Um, so again, I'm just really hopeful that when we get our winter uh, results, we were actually hoping this would be a little bit later in the month, our presentation, so we'd be able to share with you um, some of those results. But I'm, I'm thinking it's working really well. I know the teachers have been working hard to pre- and post-test students, um, and I've been looking at that data as well. 
So it's been encouraging to see some of the students who didn't pre-test as well on the post-test are showing a lot of good gains. And last, I'm a very visual learner. <laughs> so we have a data wall that um, kind of each little card that you see up there represents a, a student. And so our goal is to grow everybody to the left, to the blue, and to, to raise their scores and to raise their student achievement and close that gap. Um, that's where we were after uh, the fall testing, that we had 9% of our kids in the blue and 45% in the green, 23 in the yellow, and 23 in the red. So um, our hopes is that we, we move to the left and uh, get everybody, give everybody opportunities by continuing to look at the data and making sure that um, <coughs> we're providing opportunities for kids to achieve and, and to grow. Questions? When will you get the data for them? Well, their, um, first grade starts their winter testing next on Monday, next okay. Monday, and, um, second grade. They're, yeah, they'll be doing that in the next couple of weeks. So by the end of the month, we'll have that and be sitting down with um, grade levels again mm -hmm. to, to redo and to redo groups and, and to move forward from there. Is there any other comments from the board or the administration? Thank you, Claudia. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very good. much Thank for coming you. out. We'll move on to our next item, which is report from employee organizations. Is there a representative here from the certificated licensed employee organization that would like to speak? Seeing no one, we will move on to classified employees. Is there a representative from the classified employee organization who would like to speak? Seeing none. Report from school-related organizations. Is there a representative from a school-related organization who would like to speak? Seeing none, we will move on to community comments. I have received three yellow cards, and um, I'll call them in the order I have them, which is Mr. Mark Bennett. If you would approach the microphone, please, sir. And it looks like you would like to speak about the transportation request for proposals. Yes, sir. Thank you. Did you make sure that mic's on? Is that red light on? Yes. Okay, thank you, sir. <clears throat> My name is Mark Bennett. I'm a bus driver, uh, contract driver for Northwest. Uh, I've only been here two years. This is my first year of being contracted. Um, I do have a little bit of experience driving. I drove for 31 and a half years for Metro. Of them, 38, <coughs> of them 31 and a half years, I presided as the president and business agent of ATU Local 627. <coughs> So I am somewhat aware of situations that goes on. I have a, just a brief little thing I'd like to bring to the board's attention. <clears throat> when school boards privatize their transportation systems, they lose control. No one in the private sector would contract out a crucial integral operation without knowing the full scope of management's issues. Private firms don't typically contract out work that involve their core customers base directly, nor do they give control of their capital equipment to their outsiders. For the board to con contract out the transportation department, this is precisely what is required. <clears throat> you have three bidders, and I pick one at random. Um, <clears throat> first group is the parent company of first student. It is a, a company based in Scotland, United Kingdom. Uh, it's a conglomerate of many different companies, first student being one of the largest. <clears throat> they have uh, base revenues of like 10.5 billion generated in the United Kingdom. They have uh, another roughly 6 billion uh, generated by the first group, which operates other companies. And then they also have uh, First Student, which is roughly just in Canada, United States, hauling what you're doing. Uh, us, bus drivers, that's their job. And you see them all around town, different places. And that is probably uh, one of their better groups because it generates um, uh, roughly... Uh, Excuse me a second here. Um, 
$2.4 billion uh, with $150 million profit a year. That's what they generate. But right now, First Group as a whole has been struggling recently, having lost out on five consecutive rail contract bids in the U UK. Most recently, the company lost a bid for the lucrative East Coast Line, which accounts for almost half of its UK rail revenue. First Group is being held back financially by debt acquired through its North American expansion, despite raising $964.1 million from investors last year, the company continues to struggle with $2.2 billion in debt. First Group has lost 70% of its stock value over the last four years. This is one of the bidders you're looking at. This is just one of the three. <coughs> now, you will gain some benefits if you outsource. There are some benefits. You could see a labor rate cut. You could have less monies put into our pension plan because the way your RFP reads, you don't put it in. The bidders put it in. <coughs> uh, and there could be a possible short-term savings. <coughs> but there's disadvantages to that, too. Because with lower wages you have re and reduced benefits, you have dissatisfied workers. And then with dissatisfied workers leads to major turnover issues resulting in training problems and safety issues. <coughs> Privatization costs to retain existing workers or train new ones. Monitoring of the contractor himself, you think the contractor is going to sit out there and just do run by himself. You're wrong. You're going to have to have somebody there to watch him. And you got good people there now doing our jobs, but you want to go elsewhere, and that's your opinion and your prerogative at this point in time. Uh, and you're going to have major safety issues. Just check first transits or first student safety issues across the country. They're online. You can find them. <coughs> um, as I said, this is first student is one of three. And the reason that bid, you didn't have too many bidders, this is a very competitive field. And they've been ate up by multiple companies. Most of them are foreign owned. Veolia out of Paris, first group out of. Uh, um, Scotland, uh, you got MV, which was out of Fairfield, California, now growing larger and larger, have moved their headquarters to Dallas. They do transit. They actually run Metro's access service right now. I happen to know that. Yeah. <clears throat> and uh, so, um, you know, I'm telling you, everything isn't always just plain and simple. <clears throat> These companies, uh, uh, have a less of an incentive to do the right thing to, by cutting corners. And cutting corners is in maintenance, safety issues, which leads to uh, loss of control and loss of uh, transparency. <coughs> there is nothing about a private sector manager that makes them a better manager than a public sector manager. You have very good managers running the system now. Of course, if the savings are all, let's say, in the labor department, where you cut our wages, then by your own RFP that you've put out, the lowest bid is not necessarily the best bid. So you need to make sure when you look at these RFPs that you look at everything that's involved. You know, privatizing transportation services results in fewer rather than more bidders, cost savings far slimmer than projected, 40% of privatized system services quality and customer services negatively impacted by privatization, safety maintenance concerns, high employee turnover, all contribu contributed to this negative impact on service quality. When systems privatize operations, they lose control of their ability to respond to citizens' concerns about quality of service issues. Lower wages and reduced benefits are the game plan of private providers, leading to dissatisfied workers. This accumulates in major turnover issues, resulting in training problems, safety issues, maintenance issues, and transparency. Hidden costs involved in privatization include costs to retrain workers and monitor contractors are all part of the downside when a service goes private. I would hope that this board, when they review and make decisions, thinks hard and long about what they're doing and the lives of these people work here, because many of them, all 
live in this community. They spend their dollars in this community. They went to schools in this community. Heck, I wouldn't have normally said heck, we just had a special meeting. I grew up in Skyline Acres. <coughs> um, so, I went to so many schools in this district, it was unbelievable. They sent me to Taylor, they sent me to the new Houston Elementary, they sent me to Coleraine Elementary, they, or Middle School, then when the Pleasant Run Middle School was opening up, knew they were going to send me there. Finally, my father said, I've had enough of it, and he moved out of the district, but nonetheless, I grew up in this district for a long time. I have many friends in this district. I am here. I am retired. This job, I love doing. you got to have to love it. I've been driving a bus for the city of Cincinnati <laughs> for 31 years, let me tell you. So, I am here to tell you, I hope you all look long and serious at these RFPs and at all your employees, loyal employees that you have had working for you for many, many years. And thank you for your time. Thank, thank you, you, Mr. Bennett. Um, we have another. We have another speaker that I will refer to as Mrs. Labuno. I've known you since I was a small child, so you're Mrs. Labuno. You can start telling stories about you too. Okay, well, we'll just. Uh, sorry, the microphone's broke now. So. <laughs> Thank you for coming, Mrs. Labuno. I am here because. I have nothing to lose, nothing to gain. I've been an employee with the Transportation Department since 1976, so if you add that up, that's 38 years. Um, I'm here on behalf of my fellow co-workers who are sitting out here. They're terribly, terribly concerned about, are they going to have a job, or are they not going to have a job? Um, you said that your first consideration, if you're going for a private contractor, is safety. I think the private contractor, their, their first issue is going to be profit. That's what they're in business for. Um, I hope that you keep all that in mind. And I wanted to talk to you too, Dan. Do you remember the morning that I, I showed up at, Col at uh, LaSalle High School and you were driving the moving van with all their equipment? We were going to a band competition. And I said to you, I was very pleased that Northwest, that they were using our buses. And uh, I said, I always wondered why they didn't, because my sons went to LaSalle also. And I said, I always wondered why they never used our buses for all the transportation. And you said, well, you suggested that they use our buses because the contractors that they were using were either late, they didn't show up at all, or the buses were breaking down. And you suggested that they use our safe buses and our good drivers. I just wanted to remind you of that. Um, <laughs> I also... I don't, I, don't, I don't think I don't think I don't think mine was the original complaint on the buses not showing up. That was another person at the school well, who had suggested that. Well, you just made the comment that. that that's why they they went to. And it has, to us. and that, and, and I do appreciate the district. You know, I've I've always wondered why there wasn't more of a connection between the parochial I'm, schools and the district transportation and and the uh, service that that the district through our bus drivers has provided has worked out well for the parochial schools. Well, I know that this is not the first time that the school district considered private contracting because I've been around for a long time. And I was always told by Mr. Durr or several other people that they really that the school district wanted to keep control of their employees. They want to do their own their own drug testing, their own background check. They want to know who are driving the kids. And for that reason is the reason that they probably never went. And I'd like to know, there are many other times, and it's not been too long ago, that you consider this. Why did you not do it? If it's so great, I'd just like to know why you didn't do it. But please be aware that the lives that you're affecting back here, people are, and it's, it's stressful enough driving a bus, and now we got to drive around thinking, are we going to have a job or are we not going to have a job? So I hope that when you're looking at that, you see the faces, not just the figures on the paper. Well, and, part of, and part of what we're looking at also is with this potential reconfiguration of some yeah, of our buildings. I understand I mean, that. And I as understand. a board, we really want to go into this with as much knowledge as possible because I if we that. do change school locations somewhat, it is going to, there's just a lot of things going into the pot, and I would rather have that information now than, uh -huh. than later. And no decisions have been made. So, okay. well, thank you for thank you coming up, much. Mrs. Labuno, and I, Happy I New Year to you. <laughs> Thank you.
I've known Mrs. Labuno a very long time. She's a very good person. Uh, Greg Tedesco is here to talk about Pleasant Run Middle School. Greg, if you'd come up to the microphone, please. Hello, my name is Greg Tedesco. Uh, I've been a uh, resident within this district for over 60 years, my wife, since she's been born. Um, I had three sons, they all graduated from Northwest High School and went through all schools. I've dealt with some people in this room, although some people may have never met me before. Um, I uh, ran the Northwest basketball program, um, the league, not, not the school program, for about 23 years until it actually dissolved this year. Uh, my son uh, teaches at Pleasure Middle School and is also a basketball coach at Pleasure Middle School. I also helped him out for six years until state teachers retirement would not allow me to do it anymore. Um, I did uh, work with uh, Margie Rennie and the Durs when uh, Montford Heights Elementary was, the old Montford Heights was tore down, the new one was built, and I asked them to make sure that the gym would be the same size or larger than what it was before. Uh, that actually worked out. I was very happy about that. Uh, and now I know that the, what the school board's trying to do with the new buildings and everything as far as the district is concerned, which I think is a very good idea. Uh, I'm here to push something, obviously, not just for myself, but also for my son, since he has a coach there. But the Pleasant Middle School's gym is actually a smaller, smaller than most elementary gyms. Uh, it is a very tiny building. Uh, I was there for a game today, and when other schools come into our gym, especially kids who are in the seventh grade, they cannot believe that they're playing basketball in a gym that size. Uh, Montford Heights, again, elementary is a bigger gym than what Pleasant Middle School is. Um, <coughs> The schools like White Oak Middle School and uh, Colerain Middle School are 50 by 82 or 84. Pleasant Run Middle School is 44 by 72. Uh, my hope is that if something does happen as far as new buildings are concerned, I guess my, my big uh, wish would be uh, to make sure that you build a new middle school rather than the elementary on the Pleasant Elementary site. But if that does not occur, which obviously has nothing to do with me, uh, that if there is going to be a change at Pleasant Middle School, please make the gym at least a size that should be what basketball should be played for for kids that are of that age. Um, I guess I can pat myself on the back along with my son. Uh, since we've been uh, helping to coach kids from Pleasant Middle School, Northwest High School's had winning seasons for four or five years as far as basketball is concerned. Uh, and I will take credit for that as long as my son too. So, but. Uh, when you decide to make that, please make Pleasure Run Middle School's gym bigger. Thank you. I don't know. It sounds like that small court might give us some kind of advantage if we're <laughs> doing so well. It doesn't when your 7th and 8th grade kids uh, run out of gas when you go out to Edgewood <laughs> yeah. and you're coding stuff. And they go, what is this? This gym is way too small. I just, I, I die out here. So, uh, again, I'm going to put my two cents worth in right now. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for everything you do. Okay. And that... And, that, and that's all the yellow cards, and I would, I thought of something I'd like to mention to Mrs. Labuno because she knows I do some volunteer work. Um, I do have a Class A commercial driver's license with a yellow school bus endorsement, and I've been through the safety training, and I've been regularly drug tested, and I, I volunteer and drive for uh, the Boy Scout troop over at St. James Church, and uh, I'm aware of what goes, and I've had 30 screaming 13 year old boys in the back of the bus so I'm aware I can get a little noisy and we don't have a camera in our older model bus but um, I am aware of the uh, safety concerns and um, keep your eyes on the road and what's going on in that mirror is secondary keep the bus going down the road um, so I, I am aware of that and that was all the yellow cards that we had so we will move on to our next item which is a uh, certificated licensed personnel Dr. Jackson yes we have uh, one certificated resignation and seven extra duty procedural resignations. The superintendent recommends the Board of Education approve the certificated license, personnel retirements, and resignations as listed. So moved. Second. The motion's been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, Chris, please call a vote. Motion carries five to zero. Our next item is classified <coughs> retirements and resignations. Yes, we have uh, three classified resignations. The superintendent recommends the Board of Education approve the classified retirements and resignations as listed. So moved. Second. The motion's been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? 
I would just like to add that these agendas are always published previous to the meeting. This particular agenda has been published for over two weeks now. Yes. So people always have an opportunity to see what we're voting <coughs> on before it gets here. Is there any other discussion? Hearing none, Chris, please call a vote. The motion carries five to zero. Uh, fiscal item. Dr. Jackson? Yeah, we're going to have several fiscal items that are related to the upcoming uh, building project and operating levy. So this first one is regarding uh, the maturity of the bonds, which is ultimately going to be a 35-year bond. Um, and so you have the attachment that has a resolution on that for the maturity of the bonds. The superintendent recommends the Board of Education approve the resolution requesting the fiscal officer to certify the maximum maturity of bonds as listed. So moved. Second. The motion's been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, Chris, please call a vote. The motion carries five to zero. Our next item is a resolution declaring the necessity of levying an additional tax in excess of the 10 mil limitation and issuing bonds. Yes, this is ultimately the uh, resolution that will place both the uh, operating levy combined with a bond levy on the ballot for the May 5th election. So uh, the resolution has a $85 million for the bond. It, the actual uh, millage isn't determined yet until we figure out the rate and all that stuff for the, the financing of it. And then the um, operating levy that will be combined with it is 1.18 mils. So that's the resolution to put both of those on the ballot for the May 5th election. So the superintendent recommends the Board of Education approve the resolution declaring the necessity of levying an additional tax in excess of the 10 mil limitation and issuing bonds as listed. So moved. Second. The motion's been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? Um, just um, uh, the current emergency levy uh, was it 4.95, Dan? The it's one either 4.95 or it might have been adjusted to 5.05. I'm not sure, but yeah, this will be about half a mil less than that yeah. Yeah. by what, the time it settles out. It was adjusted above 5. I forget the exact amount, but it is yeah, above 5. Okay, so like... This will be about a half a mil less than that, but we won't know that until the auditor sends it back to us. Yes. Amy? Yes, this resolution, this SD, is filed with the county auditor, and then they'll certify it and send it back to us before we can do the next resolution. Okay. Is there any other discussion? Hearing none, Chris, please call a vote. The motion carries 5 to 0. Our next item is a resolution declaring official intent with respect to the reimbursement of a temporary of temporary advances made for capital expenditures to be made from subsequent <coughs> borrowings. Uh, yes. Amy, do you want to explain this because I wouldn't be able to? <laughs> <laughs> this is in case the project starts before the bonds sale and the proceeds are received. So we can start the project bids during timing weather and as long as it's within 18 months of receiving or selling the bonds, we can get reimbursed for those costs. So it's to be able to keep the project going as the sale of bonds. Okay, thank you. The superintendent recommends the Board of Education approve the resolution declaring official intent with respect to reimbursement as listed. So moved. Second. The motion's been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? Is this something that's typically done just as sort of an insurance policy or safety net? Yeah, to keep your project mm -hmm. moving along. Um, it just, you're going to uh, borrow that same amount. It, for the timing of it so you can get mm -hmm. the minute uh, your levy is passed to when you can get the bond sold you can still progress with your project <coughs> and then be reimbursed um, back to the district for those expenses in the meantime between between the time that you start the project and the, your bonds are sold and your revenues received okay is there any other discussion hearing none chris please call a vote the motion carries five to zero our next item is a resolution retaining bond attorneys. Yes, being bond counsel is a very specialized field, so we typically hire uh, attorneys that can specialize that. So the resolution here is to hire Dinsmore Shoals as our bond attorneys. 
The superintendent recommends the Board of Education approve the resolution retaining bond attorneys as listed. So moved. Second. The motion's been moved and seconded. <coughs> Is there any discussion? Hearing none, Chris. The motion carries five to zero. The next item is a fiscal item, resolution retaining financial structuring and underwriting services. Right. I know that uh, Amy Wells has worked the last few days to get quotes from a couple of firms regarding underwriting for the bonds. And so after uh, quite a bit of discussion, uh, we're recommending that we, the uh, board hire RBC Capital Markets to be the underwriters. So the superintendent recommends the Board of Education approve the resolution retaining financial structuring and underwriting services as listed. So moved. Second. The motion's been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? Um, yeah, Dan, um, Amy, what were the companies that applied for this? It was, we had Fifth Third quoted and RBC. Who was it? Fifth Third. RBC and Fifth Third gave us quotes. Okay. And, and we, the RBC's quote is actually $2 per thousand less than the national average, which is a saving about $170,000 for the district. Okay. The, I thought the savings, Amy, was going to be 22000 For the district over the national average of what a bond sale would cost for the district between the two quotes was around $21,000. <coughs> the okay. Very good. Thank you. Is there any other discussion? Hearing none, Chris, please call a vote. Motion carries five to zero. Our next item is a certificated licensed personnel item. Yes, we have uh, five extra duty contracts, one volunteer coach, and a resolution to hire three non licensed coaches. The superintendent recommends the Board of Education approve the certificated licensed personnel items as listed. So moved. Second. Motion's been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, Chris, please call a vote. The motion carries five to zero. We have a classified personnel item, Dr. Jackson. Yes, we have one classified substitute to approve. The superintendent recommends the Board of Education approve the classified personnel items as listed. So moved. Second. The motion has been moved and seconded. Is there any <coughs> discussion? Hearing none, Chris. The motion carries five to zero. Our next item is a curriculum and instruction item, Dr. Jackson. Yes, we have an out-of-state uh, trip for the Northwest High School Show Choir on March 7th to South Dearborn in uh, Dearborn County, Indiana. The superintendent recommends the Board of Education approve the out-of-state field trip as listed. So moved. Second. The motion's been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? Just want to wish them good luck. They had a very, did very well there last year. Is there any other discussion? Hearing none, Chris. The motion carries five to zero. Next item is a curriculum and instruction item, Dr. Jackson. Yes, this is the high school program of studies handbook that was presented at the last meeting, so we brought it back for approval. The superintendent recommends the Board of Education approve the 2015-16 high school program of studies handbook as listed. So moved. Second. It's been motioned and seconded. Is there any discussion? We have looked at this previously and discussed it previously and it's been brought back for a vote and yes. uh, I guess there's no discussion. <laughs> so we'll call for a vote. <coughs> Motion carries five to zero. Our next item is a fiscal item, the availability of financial reports online. So this was an item that you asked be added as a item for discussion regarding uh, placing financial sure. reports online. <laughs> the uh, the state treasurer, treasurer has, has developed a portal to, for districts to, and other public entities to place their uh, detailed financials online. And that's been developed over a long period of time. And uh, this has come up occasionally over the years as a discussion. And one of the, one of the holdbacks from it was the cost of doing it. And, um, we're at a point where the where Treasurer Mandel has, has made this available. And I, for, as one of the board members, would like the district to consider participation and to 
move forward with just the testing phase of it to see if there's any technical hurdles to overcome. And, and what would happen is, and anyone can tomorrow get on the treasurer's, uh, Josh Mandel State Treasurer's website and, and see some of the public entities that have already put their information up. So I would ask that, that the uh, treasurer look into this a little further and see if there's any technical hurdles we would need to overcome. And I certainly want to hear from the other four board members. Dan, is there, is there a cost to this? Uh, no, there's not. No cost. Uh, there's a gentleman up there named Spencer Gross, I think his name, and he has told us in writing that there's no cost in the treasurer, the state treasurer's office. This is one of their projects, and uh, I'd, I'd at least like to uh, take a look at it. How, so, how many other school districts? Uh, we will be the first district. There's uh, this just launched very recently in the last month, and and. Um, I'd, I'd invite anybody to take a look at it and, and see what's on there. I sent out a uh, link to it back uh, before Christmas, and hopefully every, all the other board members have had a chance to take a look. So we're just looking into it and then getting feedback from our treasurer and superintendent to, to see what they think about it. Sure, just to make sure there's no technical issues. And well, that that's different. Are we going to ask for their input to see if they what their pros and cons about it or are you telling them if there's not a technical problem then you're going to do it it's two totally different things well I, my actual goal would be to discuss it tonight as is what's on the agenda and bring it back at our next meeting if, if a motion is necessary for it or not it's i don't think i would be comfortable um bringing it back next meeting to vote on it until we have input from our treasurer's department i don't think that's fair to the treasurer's department um, to just have them look at it and then you want to vote next meeting I think we would not be um, the five of us would not be doing our jobs if we don't ask for the input of the team okay Dan I'd like to point out that um, uh, when Michael and I ran together that was certainly one of the cornerstones of our campaign the fiscal transparency I have reviewed the website and um, the University of Cincinnati all the state schools um, we might be the first um, um, local school district uh, um, K through 12 school uh, uh, entity on there but all of the major players in the state Ohio I state. saw Miami University on yeah this. I mean this isn't like we're the first one there's a lot of other um, educational uh, and other state agencies on there and um, I think what Dan's saying is he wants to make sure that our software and our data um, and information can be taken in by their system and then posted very easily I think that's what I'm hearing you say Dan sure and um, and I do believe that um, you know initially at least and when you and I talked Amy that that was something that when you came on board um, you know, you were very comfortable with, and and uh, so if you'd like to respond with any thoughts you have, I'd be curious to hear them. Yeah, I don't have a problem putting out our financial information. It's it's all public record anyway. Um, in seeing the, the checkbook and, and uh, corresponding with Spencer, I had asked them if the Uniform School Accounting software could upload into their system, and at this time, it cannot. They don't have that availability. They do have the state, because we use state software for schools. Mm -hmm. The state software for townships is able to connect with their system and load into it. So what Spencer has suggested is we could send test files and they would try to write their um, software to work with state software. And I let him know that I would have to work with our A site, uh, which helps us with state software to write a program or to find some way to extract the data and send it up to this uh, portal thing. Uh, so at this point, we don't even know if it can do it, what it would take to do it, or if there would be a resulting cost. There's not a cost from the state treasurer's office to load it into there. I just don't know if there's going to be a cost associated with trying to get to that point, and that is all um, on a preliminary basis. We haven't talked to Swokey yet to see if, uh, what the possibilities are, what we would need to do. I mean, it's all preliminary but right now the, that system cannot accept the state software data yet right and that's the plan is to send them a couple test files and see if we can work through that part of it right I'd have to work with our a site to extract sure. that data into a test file to be able to send up to them so it, it's gonna 
take like three parties ourselves, the A side and then the state treasurer's office working together. So there who, could who, be a cost from this third party, or you don't know? I, I would hope not, since we're already paying them to help us with our software, but okay. those are things I don't know yet. Okay. Andy, how, long do you, how long do you anticipate that taking? It probably just it depends on our A site, what their capabilities are and what they would need to do to send the data up. Right now, the, the state can extract our financial data and our student data and all that all the time. So, at some point, it's it's going to be available to be extracted and put up there. It's just a matter of when. I think you might have been asking how long, how many days does it take to do this test to see where we're at? Is that Jim? Yeah, yeah, right? that's, yeah. Does it take a couple of weeks, a month? I mean, is it going to be done in two days or two weeks or two months? I'd say it's probably I, something you'll know after you send it. I don't know because I don't know what the ASI, what kind of program they, if they have the right one, if they can just pull it out the way it is right now. Um, it's it's state software. It's, it's, it's the state software. I mean, they'll be able to work together and decide how they need to pull it out and load it into their system and how they make the programs talk to each other. Did you have any comments, Michael? Um, no, I'm just, <clears throat> I'm very glad that we are, we are pursuing this and certainly uh, we have a lot of information out there in various sources. There's been information available on the Ohio Department of Education's website. This is an extra tool that's really going to help people understand how we spend our money and how we compare to other districts, then I'm all in favor of it. If, if there are some glitches that make this unworkable, please let us know. I mean, there was an, before you were here, there was an interest uh, among some members of our board, myself included, about uh, looking into uh, privatizing or contracting out the payroll. And uh, it was looked at very briefly. I, I kind of knew there, there might be a glitch with the state software and the vendors, and that's pretty much what happened, and it made it, uh, made it not cost effective because the, our system couldn't talk to the, the vendor system. And uh, whereas, you know, so that pretty much put it into it. We're not going to uh, try to do something that's not feasible. So certainly, please pursue with this and um, let us know if there's any obstacles. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Amy. And we'll uh, we'll ask you to put the continuing discussion on the next agenda. So thank you. Our next item is community comments and questions. If there's someone in the audience that has a question or comment specific to anything that's been discussed tonight. I'd ask that you please approach the microphone. My name, everything. Go the right way. Hello, Elaine. Elaine. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I have a few notes back there. I'm in favor of keeping around bus drivers here for simple reason the kids know them. The parents will save your kids going to school with them. We have much bus service, a whole bus service now anyway, but when we do have, I have to keep what we have now. But you need to control who's, who works for you. Same with custodians. If the kids know these people and they feel safe with them, we bring all these strangers in there. We had a, pro we had a problem years ago when um, Courtney Townsend had her own police department and we haven't gone back. And they, they contacted with Hamlin County. Well, they had, had one of the banks had a robbery. They went to the wrong place because they didn't know the people. What was that? And that's what I'm worried about. We need to take bus drivers going and custodians here. When the kids know. That's one for today. And it's great to see you guys working well together. I'm very proud of all the five of you. And the website, put some of the website. I'm proud with that at all. But what exactly will it show? People's salaries or any privacy things? What, what um, if, and I invite anybody to go to the state treasurer's website, I believe. But Mr. Mandel has a link there. And you can look at it and see what Miami University and some of the other college schools I mean, have. Is it the higher ups um, or is Personally, I, I do not have a desire to put salaries on there at this time because I just think it would breed a lot of, uh, it might lead to some internal um, distractions in, in the school. But, but uh, I think that by putting some of the expenditures on there, I think it would breed innovation. It would allow different people to see some of the different products that they might not know the district's buying. I have no problem with that as long as, you know, people's privacy is protected. And well, that, that's certainly paramount, so. Yeah, Elaine, the, the teacher salaries are already out there. Well, yeah, I know that. Part. Yeah, I mean, it's not like that's a big secret. It's ultimately, I would like that because it puts everything in one place. I don't think we need to start with that. 
but it's out there. I mean, it, you can find pretty much anything on the internet, and if it's taxpayer supported, I I was amazed. I went to a website and um, uh, a medical website, and some of the data that they had on me, um, I I didn't know that it, that existed, uh, I, and how this group put it together um, just boggled my mind. Well, right now, yeah. just, you can go to the hospital right now, and they can pull your records from any hospital. Well, and that's not good either. That's, that's, that's too much privacy going on. And we're going to take a look at that and let the let okay. it play out. So thank, thank you. you, Elaine. Thanks, Elaine. Was there anyone else from the audience that wanted to make a comment or had a question? And hearing no one, we will move on to our next item, which is board member items. Mr. Detzel. I don't have any comments tonight, Dan. Mr. Harlow. <clears throat> thank you for electing me. Uh, Vice President of the Board of Education, thank all of my fellow board members for that. Looking forward to a, a great 2015 and uh, looking forward to uh, a, a levy campaign that's uh, going to be a lot of work but also a lot of fun. Uh, Mrs. Detzel? Um, pretty much, I think I've already said it as far as number one, it is great that all five board members are going to work together for this building campaign. Um, I think that's crucial to get it get it passed. Um, again, I just want to reiterate, this could not happen if it wasn't for the sacrifices our staff, all our staff has made with having three years of, of pay freezes. Um, I know Elaine, I want to thank you, Dave Denny, um, for the work we we had the tough part of making those cuts that were painful, painful to the kids, painful to the staff, painful to the community. And um, without that, I truly believe we would not be here. So I think we, we've definitely shown the community that we're um, fiscally responsible. We've now come up with a way that we can do this and it not only not increase your taxes, but they could go down a tad. And um, I think we've got some exciting times ahead. So, so it's it's going to be a good 2015. Mr. Heater, Dan. The, the only thing I want to say is um, with the transportation issue, um, it's always been an issue that I've always um, been kind of keen on. Um, this is not a done deal. I mean, sending out RFPs, uh, it better be pretty compelling. Uh, I mean, if I agree. I mean, I like having the control. There's been some issues with some of our own personnel over the last few years um, that maybe has brought us to this, but um, I have seen in the news issues with contracted uh, services with drivers not showing up. Um, it's got to be pretty compelling, so I don't want you to think that this is going to be, you know, just automatically rubber stamped and put through. So I don't know if that gives you any Solace or not, but um, it, 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 at least I want you to know that that this is not a done deal. No, well, I don't know what else I can say. Thank you, Chris. And I'd like to take my board member item. For those of you who have not met her, our new treasurer is Amy Wells, and, and she comes to us from Bethel Tate Schools, and this is her first meeting, and I'm sure she just loves it. And uh, <laughs> got a lot of you were in a couple times over the last few months during the transition, and we're really pleased to have you here and. Uh, I believe your experience included 10 or 11 years in the auditor's office and then your time at Bethel Tate along with all the other involvement that you've had with various professional groups and, and improvement groups. And uh, so you're very welcome here and, and we're looking forward to the many successful years with you. So thanks, Amy. And this is Amy here. So um, with no other comments, we will move on to our next item, which is a, I'm calling for a motion for adjournment. So moved. Second. Uh, motion's been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, Chris, please call for a vote. Motion carries 5 to 0, and this meeting is adjourned. Thank you all for coming. <laughs>